everyone uh, <clears throat> good to uh, be able to share my personal views on the topic of the evolving threat of terrorism and militancy in South Asia and beyond and why in my view total defense is still pretty much relevant in the age of COVID-2019. So essentially uh, I have uh, just basically three aims in the time allotted for this uh, webinar. I want to uh, try and share my uh, views on the evolving nature of the terrorist threat to Southeast uh, Asia and uh, well beyond. In particular, I want to zoom in on two aspects of the evolving terrorist threat, essentially the ideological aspect, which is very important, as we shall see. And of course, how the ideological threat is manifested uh, in the physical domain in terms of the active threat, which uh, counterterrorism practitioners need to deal with. And ultimately, I will try to uh, reinforce the need for a total defense approach. So when we look at the changing nature of terrorism, this is a very big topic, uh, can't really do much in 20 minutes, but what I can say is that after so many decades, right, there is no real uh, UN level consensus uh, legal definition of uh, terrorism, which all governments and societies will accept. There have been more than uh, over 100 definitions uh, of uh, proposed for terrorism. We can do an entire course on it, but we won't. But what we can say at this point is that I think most uh, analysts would argue that terrorism can be at, uh, you know, uh, understood in essence as the deliberate use of extra normal violence by a group for a purpose, right? And the purpose usually is to force a population and its government to give in to the terrorist group's demand. So essentially terrorism is a form of uh, propaganda of the deed. Of, uh, it's, a, it's a violent political communication to force the government of the day to give in to its demands. In, so, in earlier secular revolutionary waves of terrorism, before the current religiously motivated wave, you could say that terrorists wanted a lot of people watching, not a lot of people did. And this is a famous saying by the American scholar, uh, Brian Michael Jenkins back in the 1970s, the first generation of terrorism scholars. So essentially what he was trying to say was that ultimately the terrorist groups of the past, which were driven by more secular uh, nationalist revolutionary goals, uh, use terrorism as a tactic to coerce the government to give in to its demands. So ultimately, if the demands were met, the, the violence would cease. So there was a form of armed negotiation. However, we are living in what some terrorism scholars call the fourth wave or religiously motivated and uh, increasingly identity driven wave of terrorism where mass casualty attacks are more common compared to the past. In the past, violence was always calibrated, right? I mean, it was, a, it was a form of, as I said, armed negotiation. So if you give in to what I want, violence will stop. And the violence was always directed at particular targets or civilians who were seen generally as uh, collaborationists with the government of the day. But nowadays, in the religious and identity motivated wave, right, it doesn't seem to be the case anymore. There, there is religious and identity motivated terrorists want a lot of people dead and a lot of people watching as well. So this is a very big phenomenon, uh, the current fourth wave of terrorism, so-called fourth wave we are living in right now. So we can't really cover everything, but I'll focus and zoom in on two aspects, two, two manifestations of this uh, religious and identity driven wave of terrorism and extremism, right? Uh, which we are very familiar with, uh, at least one of them the Islamist uh, uh, extremist terrorist threat, as well as increasingly important, uh, in my view, the white supremacist extremist terrorism threat. Islamist extremist terrorism is not new to us uh, in this part of the world. Uh, I mean, we do know about Al-Qaeda and Jamaa Islamia in the past, uh, not to these wisdom uh, past. In, in, uh, ever since uh, 2014, we have had the emergence of ISIS, which is, of course, a splinter faction of Al-Qaeda. And ISIS has sought to expand its influence into Southeast Asia. And the, the, the greatest uh, uh, sign that ISIS is very serious about expanding its influence in Southeast Asia is, of course, the Marawi fighting in Mindanao, in Southern Philippines, uh, in, uh, between May and October 2017, when, uh, when essentially that battle raged for five months, you know, before the uh, pro-ISIS groups, uh, Abu Sayyaf group, Malte group, uh, Bangsamoro, Islamic Freedom uh, Fighters, Sakala, Philippines, 
these four pro ISIS groups were defeated. <clears throat> so why, why Mindanao? Well, Mindanao has had decades, right, of uh, Muslim separatist insurgency with uh, certain international links to uh, terrorist groups. Abu Sayyaf group for many uh, decades has had uh, international terror links, for example, right? So Mindanao was very uh, seen as a very uh, promising uh, uh, area for ISIS to fish in troubled waters in the region. So as you know, foreign fighters were detected uh, in uh, Marawi, uh, beyond uh, uh, the uh, Philippines, also Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and even beyond the, the region from uh, 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 the Middle East as well. And the uh, post Marawi, the, the, the persistent uh, ISIS threat was also seen uh, dramatically in the January 29 suicide attack on the Catholic Church in uh, Yolo, in the Sulu Archipelago in the Southern Philippines, uh, ISIS claimed responsibility for that. That was apparently uh, organized by the Abu Sayyaf group. And the two suicide bombers were Indonesians. They were not from the Philippines. They were actually Indonesians. So you can see the transnational element of the threat. And, not, and as far as uh, Singapore is concerned, we are not spectators. We are also heavily uh, engaged in this. because, For, for one thing, we've had uh, uh, Singaporean ISIS militants, just to remind uh, one and all, Abu Yukal uh, was seen in an actual ISIS video executing uh, prisoners in December 2017. So the Islamist extremist terror threat to Southeast Asia is, uh, is not a fic uh, fiction. You know, it's very much real. Uh, in 2018, right, we, we had uh, the phenomenon which emerged of what a, a, Philipp a very senior Philippine uh, defense official called uh, the rise of family terrorism, where in, in quite a disturbing development, uh, entire families uh, in Indonesia uh, were radicalized. And this was seen in the uh, Surabaya attack, attacks of uh, May 2018, when churches, uh, three churches and a police station were attacked by three different families that were all radicalized, right? And in fact, there was also uh, in the top picture, uh, uh, Indonesian minister Wiranto was actually stabbed by a radicalized uh, couple as well, uh, who were, and both the, this incident in, in October 2018, the attack on uh, Minister Wiranto and the May 2018 attack uh, on Surabaya were done by members who were part of the <coughs> Jama Ansharu Daula group in Indonesia, which is a pro uh, ISIS network. So the attack on Viranto was actually in October 2019. So essentially, the families in the Surabaya attack, it was a very sad case, were exposed to uh, Islamist extremist ideology, preachers and videos at, at weekly uh, JAD gatherings. So this again reinforces the dangers of extremist Islamist ideology. It is not something to be trifled with. It can actually influence people to do things, right? So what is the ideological basis for Islamist extremism? Now in the academic literature, right, the, there's, there's a lot written about this, but I mean, uh, different termino terminology has been used. For example, uh, I would say Salafi jihadism is quite uh, often used, also jihadi Salafism. I've even seen Bin Ladenism or al Qaedaism. <laughs> So regardless of the isms, right, uh, they're talking about essentially roughly the same phenomenon of Islamist extremism. So what is this uh, ideological narrative, this narrative, right? It essentially says that there is a war going on between the Muslim world uh, and uh, the term which comes out in the propaganda of uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, even Jama'a Islamia in the past, right, is uh, the evil Jewish crusader axis. So what this means is essentially they're talking about the threat to the global uh, Muslim community posed by the U.S., Israel, and the coalition of friendly governments, right? And Al-Qaeda and ISIS and their affiliated networks around the world see themselves, portray themselves as defending the global Islamic community against this Jewish crusader axis. And they uh, exploit, this is a very important point, they exploit social media to do so, to sort of build uh, uh, new networks around the world, recruit new members, uh, circulate the, the materials, and essentially social media empowers them. And a key element of this uh, Islamist extremist thought is the idea that, you know, how come civilians can be targeted? You know, in the laws of war, laws of uh, armed conflict, right, there's such a thing as a non-combatant immunity, right? But in uh, the 
uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda and extremist Islamist ideologues they invert that they, they say that there is actually no such thing as innocent civilians. Why? Because innocent civilians in the West, right, and allied civilians are also uh, guilty because although they are not directly uh, involved in oppressing uh, Muslim communities around the world, their political support and their, and their taxes enable their governments to do so. So they are guilty and they can be targeted. So this is why uh, groups like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they have absolutely no problem targeting civilians, uh, whether they are in nightclubs or discos or markets or airports or aircraft or trains, you know, it's, so it's uh, shopping centers, right? We have seen this, we have seen this. So it is a real dangerous uh, ideology. And the other key element in the ideology is the idea of uh, reciprocity. So this uh, extremist Islamists are saying that if you target our civilians, and unfortunately in some of the Western uh, uh, military attacks, civilians have been killed uh, in an accidental inadvertent, but these, these uh, what I call political oxygen is exploited <clears throat> adroitly by uh, Islamist extremist uh, ideologues to say that, you know, the, this is not an attack on, 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 on combatants. This is an attack by the West on entire Muslim communities, civilians, women and children are targeted. So the idea is you target our civilians, we will also target your civilians. So there's this idea of reciprocity which adds to the danger. But one of the things I want to also bring up now and highlight because this is a, a, a dangerous emerging phenomenon is that it seems to have emerged in, I, something like an ideological mirror image of Islamist extremism. Which, which, which has uh, different names, but I will cons you can also call it to me, uh, white supremacist extremism. And this is a very broad uh, movement, global movement, uh, which uh, encompasses various elements, various streams like white nationalism, neo-Nazism, uh, Christian reconstructionism, Christian identity, identitarianism, and other emerging strains. So, it's actually quite a complex phenomenon, so and, and uh, analysts are trying to come to grips with uh, the various elements. But one major theme which has emerged in white supremacist, supremacist extremism is this idea that there is a Judeo-Christian identity, European identity, which is under threat by especially non-white immigration. Depending on who you read, right, the, the, the threat comes from Jews or sometimes Hispanics, but uh, if you look at a European context and in, in, in uh, some other contexts, uh, in, in New Zealand, for example, the Christchurch terrorist Brenton Tarrant, who attacked the, the Christchurch mosque in 20, uh, 2019, right, he referred to white genocide. In fact, he's not the only one. There are other extremists that talk about white genocide. In other words, the Judeo-Christian European nations are going to be overwhelmed by invasion by non-white immigrant minorities. And just as, uh, you know, the on the extremist Islamist side, uh, you have Al-Qaeda and ISIS saying that they are trying to defend the global Muslim community. On this side, the white supremacist side, there are also similar groups. You know, Tarrant, uh, at the bottom, on the right, you can see Tarrant, Brendan Tarrant, who was influenced by the, by the guy uh, on the left, which is uh, uh, Anders Breivik, the Norwegian uh, white supremacist who killed 77 uh, people in Norway uh, in uh, 2011. They were white supremacists. They were, they were uh, inspired by this idea that, you know, there's going to be an a invasion uh, of uh, minorities and immigrants, and there is a need to defend the, the, the white European identity, right? So there are groups that they have emerged. Both uh, Tarrant and uh, Breivik referenced the Reborn Knights Templar, which is actually a reference to a 12th century Christian force that fought Muslim forces in the Crusades. But there are other European networks one uh, significant network that has emerged is a so-called Azov Battalion in the Ukraine, but there are other similar uh, affiliates worldwide. They, are, they, are, they see themselves as defending white nations against uh, so-called Muslim invasion. And just like the uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, these groups are trying to uh, exploit social media to sort of get, get supporters. You think Breivik himself talked about uh, you know, the power of decentralization, you know. And in terms of targets, uh, the white supremacists target uh, Western political elites who they say promote multiculturalism and therefore because of this, they are too soft on immigrants and they therefore with the so many immigrants coming in, they so-called white genocide, right? And therefore these politicians should be targeted as well as of course, the so-called non-white invaders, the term invaders I took from the manifesto of uh, Tarrant, 
who are in overwhelming white populations and the social systems worldwide to great, uh, through not just taking jobs, but in the older long term, greater fertility rates. So this is the so-called great replacement discourse, right? Which even the, the name of uh, Darren's manifesto is called the great De uh, replacement. And you know, just like the, <clears throat> the uh, Islamist extremists, there is this principle of reciprocity or an eye for an eye on the part of the white supremacists. So for example, in the Taren, uh, Brenton Terrence Manifesto, he, what, when he tried to explain why he attacked the uh, Christchurch Moss when he was saying that, well, he wanted to take revenge. Revenge for what? For, well, in this, and this is a quotation from his manifesto, hundreds of thousands of deaths caused by foreign invaders throughout European history. In more recent times, thousands of European lives lost to terror attacks throughout European lands, referring to the attacks of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And in particular, in his manifesto, it seemed to be very affected by the death of this uh, young uh, girl, Eber Eklan, in, in Stockholm uh, through a car attack, a ramming attack, vehicle attack by Islamist extremists. He was very, appeared to be very emotional about this. But so, you, so you, you see, the thing is, there is a dynamic going on. So the white supremacist side is being fueled and radicalized by the Islamist side and vice versa. So is this uh, what some analysts call reciprocal radicalization going on, which is very dangerous. So how do we compare the threats, right? If you look at some uh, boring statistics for a bit, right? 73% uh, of deadly violent extremist incidents in the US uh, in a particular, between 2001 and 2016 were, were done by the white supremacist side with Islamists uh, having only about 23%. That's a uh, Sufan Center's assessment. Another uh, assessment by the Institute for Economics and Peace uh, uh, recently said that, you know, uh, between uh, taking Western Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand together, the white supremacist attacks were more, right, than the Islamist attacks. So there, are, there seem to be more and more white supremacist attacks. But in terms of the lethality, right, uh, which, which side kills more people? Uh, Europol in 2018 did a study uh, between 1970 and 2018 in the West, and they said that the, actually there were more Islamist attacks that killed more than 10 people compared to the white supremacist side. So while the white supremacist attacks in the West are becoming increasingly numerous, they are not really as currently, currently, they are not really as deadly as the Islamist terrorist attacks. So with the average Islamist terrorist attack uh, since 1970 causing uh, well, you can see 3.6 deaths as opposed to less than one death on average for the white supremacists. So bottom line is white supremacist attacks are becoming more frequent than Islamist attacks, but Islamist attacks on balance are still more deadly than the white supremacist attacks. So how does this translate in terms of the physical threat, right? Uh, I would say that there are two tracks. One is the organized terrorist networks, which has been around for a long time. But increasingly, because of social media, you see the emergence of lone wolves inspired, not necessarily directed, but inspired by organized networks. We have certainly seen, certainly as far as the Islamist threat in Southeast Asia is concerned, the organized element. I mean, so if you ask me, we, we have to pay attention to future attacks by relatively organized Islamist extremist networks, for example, plots by local groups in the region, Abu Sayyaf group, for example, in the southern Philippines, uh, other groups in the Philippines, Indonesia, which have pledged allegiance to ISIS. And for example, the picture on the left, uh, the bottom left, there's a guy called Sunakim. He, this picture was taken a few minutes before he was shot dead by the Indonesian uh, police. And this was the, uh, the Jakarta attack in January 2016. He had been radicalized by the, the, the guy on top, this Aman Abdurrahman, who is by most accounts, the most dangerous uh, Islamist extremist in Indonesia. He's very influential ideologue. So you have groups that are pro-ISIS in Southeast Asia, which are relatively, uh, well, relatively organized networks that could carry out attacks on behalf of ISIS. Then, of course, with the, uh, the loss of the territorial caliphate of ISIS in, uh, in the Middle East, Syria and Iraq, uh, there have been, by some accounts, some Southeast Asian fighters coming back, about 1,000 or so, had gone there in the first place. This was, many of them had stayed there, but several had tried to come back. In fact, some uh, reports indicated that uh, about 15 Indonesians and about uh, a smaller number of Malaysians had fought overseas and managed to come back to the region. And in fact, reports indicate that between 2017 and 2018, uh, Indonesian returnees were implicated in 
uh, false bomb plot and attack on the police. So you have that organized threat. Uh, not, and as far as Singapore is concerned, right, we, the organized threat also exists. We, and we, of course, we, we should remember the, the well-known uh, incident about four years ago, the Marina Bay uh, Sands plot, right, where essentially there was a plot by a, a pro-ISIS cell based in Batam that wanted to target Marina Bay Sands. And the, the cell was in touch with the gentleman on the left, uh, Barun Naim, who's now dead. Uh, he was a key Indo Indonesian ISIS leader based in, in Syria. And in fact, uh, there was communication by telegram uh, going on between uh, Gigi Ramad Deva, the, the guy in Batam on, on the right, uh, and uh, Barun Naim uh, in Syria. So communication instructions on bomb making were done via telegram, right? The encrypted social media app. And as we know in general, it is, uh, Singapore has been identified as a potential target in online Islamist extremist publications as reported uh, in, in June 2017, right? So Singapore sport, the stock exchange, for example, have been identified online. So it's uh, nothing new. So the lone wolf threat to me as an analyst should be you know, uh, taken note of because the internet, social media gives uh, uh, increasing and indiscriminate access to information about uh, how to wreak havoc in society. There's a well-known article in the uh, Al-Qaeda online English magazine called, uh, the Inspire magazine called, How to Make a Bomb in the Kitchen of Your Mom, which was actually trans even translated into Bahasa right, in our region. And you know, when you talk about lone wolf threats, there's been a range of people nowadays writing about this. It can range, uh, some people say that, you know, in future, uh, well-educated lone wolf could even maybe try to employ uh, CBRN, you know, but, but that's, that's, uh, that to me is uh, a bit, uh, not, not that immediate yet, right? We should pay attention to it though. But the more immediate threat is what some uh, people have called the weaponization of everyday life, using knives, using cars, using trucks. Simple everyday weapons can be weaponized. And as we have seen very clearly in the London attacks in March and June 2017, and the thing is, you see, the white supremacists do read what the Islamist extremists say, right? And so they, they, they both get influence, right? Each side influences each other. And in fact, there's, there's very diverse lone wolf threats. You can use a truck, as you can see uh, in the German example. Uh, you can get a hand on weapons like a, a high-powered rifle. Uh, you, can, you can see on the, on the picture as well. Uh, if you can't get a high-powered rifle, you can make use of a you know, the, the son picture, the, that guy, uh, he used a chopper and he killed a British soldier in broad daylight. And by the way, the, you see the term there, uh, I mean the, the, the headline, we killed British soldiers and eye for an eye. That's the extremist Islamist ideology right there. That is right there. That basically is the principle of reciprocity. It's the eye for an eye, right? So, so the, 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 the lone wolf, or you have a couple of guys working together and, they call, and that is called a wolf pack seems to be emerging as a very powerful form of the new terrorist threat today, globally. Both the Islamist and white supremacist sites, I mean, at the bottom, you see that's Brenton Tarrant, and he was a lone wolf, and he killed many people. Lone wolf attacks can be very dangerous. And you know, the Christchurch attacker that is Tarrant talked about using trucks in ramming attacks, and this has already been done by ISIS. So, so you see there is this reciprocal radicalization and even reciprocal learning going on. And in this process, I cannot overemphasize this, social media is very important. It's very strategic. Globally, both Islamists and white supremacist extremism seem to be fueling each other in a cycle of reciprocal radicalization into terrorist actions. So internet and social media platforms help and facilitate this reciprocal radicalization. So the New Zealand Prime Minister, uh, Mrs. Arden, was, very, was correct in calling for uh, a ban on the dissemination of the Christchurch mosque shooting video. Why? On the one hand, such a video, which was live streamed, as you remember, on Facebook, could have fueled possible copycat attacks, right, by other white supremacists uh, elsewhere. At the same time, it could have fueled retaliatory attacks by Islamist extremists angered by what Tarrant had done. So the, one of the most constructive things that had been done uh, after the Christchurch attacks in 2019 was the so-called Christchurch call, if you, rem if you uh, remember May 2019, just over a year ago, for governments and social media companies to eliminate extremist content online. That is a very powerful uh, and symbolic call, but of course, 
uh, you know, the details are important and there is a need for governments and tech companies to work together on this example, right, of uh, uh, how the Christchurch video circulated and had an impact. This gentleman, John Ernest, uh, soon after the Christchurch attacks, he attacked a, a synagogue. He killed a lady and injured a rabbi and other worshippers. He was inspired by the Christchurch mosque, mosque shootings and uh, another earlier uh, attack by another guy uh, previous year in, in the US. And this gentleman, Ernest, he attended church. He quoted Bible verses in his, and he had his own manifesto online. So he was, this example of how the Christchurch uh, uh, video uh, and manifesto influenced uh, white, other white supremacists. And this guy also uh, admit he attacked both Jews and Muslims. On the other hand, there's this guy, uh, Mark Stephen Domingo, who was a U.S. Army veteran of the Afghan war, convert to Islam. He wanted to take revenge for the Christchurch attacks, and he vented a lot on social media, right? And by the way, you see in the picture of uh, Domingo, you see uh, he was trying to make a pressure cooker bomb, right, using nails, and, and he got the information online, and I suspect it's from that uh, article, how to make a bomb for the, from the kitchen of your mom. Right? So I believe that there might have been an influence there. Anyway, he, this guy wanted to bomb a white extremist ra rally. He also had high power weapons, but he was thwarted and arrested by the FBI. So now, one of the questions we, we will, of course, have to address is, we are, as we all know, unfortunately, we are dealing with a pandemic. But if you ask me, has there been any transformational impact of COVID-19 on the track picture? I, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I think at this stage, uh, there has been uh, perhaps a layer of uh, complexity added, but it's nothing really uh, transformational in my view. Operationally, security forces and law enforcement resources and tension have been diverted because there is a, as we all know, we have all seen a whole of nation COVID-19 response. And because law, law enforcement and security forces have been diverted, they have uh, given greater space for the Islamists and the Islamist extremists and the white supremacists to, and lone wolves to operate. So in our part of the world, in April, there's a major attack by the Abu Sayyaf on the armed forces of the Philippines. Uh, and that created some uh, unfortunate uh, casualties for the AFP. And the AFP said that it was the deadliest attack uh, since the January 2019 uh, YOLO Cathedral bombings. Uh, as for the white supremacists, they have actually called on those followers that uh, were infected to deliberately spread COVID-19 to law enforcement and minority communities. So in fact, the site intelligence group uh, assessed that the white supremacists and extremists are even more aggressive than the Islamists thus far, and they go much further in exploiting COVID-19 to try and uh, affect the, uh, the operational situation. But I think also important, COVID-19 has given uh, uh, the, the ideological narratives a boost in the sense that, for example, Islamist extremists in Southeast Asia, for example, uh, JD Indonesia claimed that COVID-19 is, uh, you know, well, some of them actually uh, claim that COVID-19 is God's sign that, you know, the, the extremists will win because God is punishing the infidels and the apostates, right? Whereas uh, on the white supremacist, supremacist side, there are groups like the Atom Weapon Division and the base, which are US, US uh, based, but they have transnational links. They are, they are talking about uh, uh, this philosophy called accelerationism, which is, well, you know, we can employ uh, the COVID, we can exploit the COVID-19 pandemic to sort of uh, uh, try and accelerate a collapse of society, create a civil war, and in the process, the, the white ethno state will, will emerge. So there's this accelerationist uh, idea getting a boost through COVID-19. So essentially, COVID-19 has been exploited by both sides for their own purposes and definitely to try and boost the morale of their respective followers. So what does all of this mean for us? Well, especially we talk about total defense, which is to me is always a relevant concept. I think uh, one of the, uh, some of the key findings on how to fight extremist narratives like white supremacism and Islamist extremism, which uh, emerged from uh, RSIS big conference with the Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy three years ago, I think are, are still relevant, right? There's, a, there's important to engage women and youth because women and youth have a strategic role to play in countering uh, extremist narratives. They, have the, they are usually targeted, as we have seen uh, this whole family terrorism thing. So they, they, their input is needed to sort of 
counter the uh, extremist narratives. Social media companies definitely have a big role to play. So, and this was uh, identified as well as a key takeaway. And of course, religious leaders in terms of, uh, certainly on the, especially I would say on the Islamist extremist side, they have a role to play in identifying the theological baseline uh, against which the extremists have uh, gone astray. So I think that is still a very important role to play. But ultimately, one thing which uh, emerged from that conference, and in fact, many other uh, events and uh, conferences, is that there's no such thing as a purely kinetic solution to extremism. Extremism is a very complex issue that cannot be defeated by purely military and hard law enforcement alone. You really need a whole society approach. You need to engage many stakeholders. And this is, of course, what total defense is all about. So a whole society approach towards terrorism and extremism remains extremely relevant, even in an age of uh, COVID-19. So with that, I, I end my presentation. Thank you for your attention. We're happy to take your questions later. Thank you for being here. So um, I would like to begin by giving an overview of the cyberspace and cyber operations. So. The cyberspace is what I call a multidimensional domain where many conflicts and crimes incubate and spread to the physical world. The domain can be a weapon, a target, and a threat vector all at the same time. So threat actors leverage the cyberspace not only for precursors to acts of harm, but also as a means of conducting political warfare. Cyber operations are both a method and force multiplier to intimidate or influence the target. These operations comprise cyber attacks that hack the digital infrastructure of a country and cognitive attacks that weaponize information to hack the hearts and minds of people in the targeted state. Non-state actors such as cyber criminals and extremists use cyber operations to scam, mobilize and keep harmful ideas and impulses alive. Now, for example, in January 2019, when the Islamic State was losing in the physical battlefield, the pro-ISIS hacker group Caliphate Cyber Shield posted online that it will carry on fighting by targeting financial systems and personal data. Their activities, however, appear to be mostly website hacking as part of their online propaganda. Cyber attacks that disrupt our lives could undermine the trust and confidence between the state and people. Now, some people said they are reluctant to use the Singapore's Trace Together Contact Tracing Act app, and the reason is they remember the Sing Health cyber attack in 2018 that affected 1.5 million patient records. Cognitive attacks are basically psychological operations that make us have doubts about the national and social values that keep us together. For example, in 2019, the Facebook page, Muslims Underrepresented in Singapore, which share the same acronym as the, or, as the Real Islamic Religious Council of Singapore, made some postings that cast aspersions on how the council uses the money that Singaporean Muslims contribute for social welfare. Now, cyber operations could supplement broader influence campaigns to impose indirect pressure on countries. They are difficult to defend against even without the distractions of COVID-19. The fog of war that accompanies cyber operations create more options for conflict than peace. And the continual use of cyber operations means that rival states are entrenched in perpetual hostility. As rival states engage in cyber operations to expand or defend their spheres of influence, it is inevitable that smaller states may be caught in between. Now, COVID-19 has highlighted the interconnectedness of people and economies around the world, but it has also made geopolitical, geopolitical rivalry more worrying. For example, the United States believe that China is exploiting opportunities from COVID-19 to undermine American security interests and intimidate regional states that claim the waters of South China Sea. Conversely, China believes that the United States is using COVID-19 as, as an instrument in its global campaigns against China's rise. Looking ahead, cyber ops could rise in frequency and intensity. COVID-19 and its social economic impact are expected to linger for years. So hostile actors, could blindside a targeted state by exploiting the impact of COVID-19 to further their foreign policy objectives. Also, it is the strategy of cyber criminals to exploit people's fears, anxiety, and information overload during crisis. They will increase the exploitation of cyberspace because COVID-19 has 
led to more digitalization and therefore expanded the cyber attack surface. I will now elaborate on information operations. So uncertainties during crisis not only make people demand more information, but also make them more vulnerable to deception and misdirection. This slide gives us a sense of the spread of falsehoods linked to COVID-19. From January to May this year, there were about 4,000 COVID-19 related hoaxes across 74 countries. So, information operations is just like propaganda of the past that the Soviet Union used to exert influence in the West. The difference today is the internet and social media, which makes info ops more methodical and affordable. Advances in data science and big data allow us to gain a deeper understanding of social behaviors, how information spread through groups, and why certain groups are more vulnerable to falsehoods. So in the past, Machudong had said that political power comes from the barrel of a gun. I would say today that political power comes from the networks of digital devices. So info ops are useful to boost the perceived strength, soft power, and support for the policies of the threat actor and to intimidate, sow discord, and weaken an adversary soft power. For example, this year, the research firm Graphica discovered that a pro-China spam network had used video, text, and memes to spread political content across social media. What these accounts did were replying, liking, and sharing each other's posts and may change names to avoid detection. What this spam network does is to counter conversations that are critical about how China handles the COVID-19 outbreak and also describing how Western media and politicians are prejudiced. In combining with cyber attacks, info ops can actually shape public opinion and behavior. So in info ops, our thoughts, our emotions, and the ideas that we subscribe to becomes the strings that hostile actors as puppeteers would, like to would use to manipulate us the puppets. So when we fight info ops, we are essentially trying to protect the autonomy of our decisions and by extension, the autonomy of our society and state. Info ops happen in three ways broadly. First is spreading falsehoods or manip manipulated information. Second, hacking into databases and then leaking the confidential or compromising information. Third, using trolls or bots for extra turfing which artific artificially amplify and make it appear as if many people believe in certain ideas. It is not just about the weaponization of information, but also the weaponization of narratives. In this regard, a hostile actor could build narratives around an idea with a strong potential for spin, agitate or, de or desensitize the emotional state of the target audience, and reduce complex ideas into simple symbolic messages like contagious memes. So why is it difficult to fight info ops? The problem lies with what is fake and what is fact. Can we be really objective in the way that we think and what we say? Objectivity can actually be challenged when ideas, issues, and individuals are framed to the, through the lenses of ethnicity, partisanship, religion, and nationalism. So, a Russian journalist, Dmitry Kiselev, once said reportedly that objectivity is a myth which is proposed and imposed on us. Now, what he said basically highlights that we are all vulnerable to cognitive manipulation. We believe that something is objective if the messenger appears credible, if we cannot see how emotions persuade us, and if we, and if we perceive the arguments to be logical or persuasive. Now, let's take a look at some of the recent info op strategies and tactics that are happening around the world. What happens out there can happen to Singapore by taking the shape that fits our issues and context. Firstly, Google's, Google Australia had made a submission earlier to Australia's Select Committee on Foreign Interference through Social Media. Google highlighted some challenges that it faced. For instance, cases of deception may not be clear all the time. Algorithms may not be able to determine whether a piece of content on current events is true or false, nor can they assess whether they inten assess the intention of the creator just by looking at what is on the posting. Moreover, big tech companies may have different definition and threshold for subversive political content compared to governments. 
Google, however, has learned certain things from its monitoring of coordinated, inauthentic online behavior. Specifically, hostile actors are very persistent and they try to change their strategies even as social media companies try to counter them. In particular, state-backed actors tend to repeatedly attack the targets, which include geopolitical rivals, government officials, journalists, and activists. Some of these actors may even impersonate news outlets, journalists, or subject matter experts. Secondly, on fake experts. They may be more influential than trolls or bots because they engage the audience at a more cerebral level. One example is this person by the name of Lin Nguyen, whose online biography claims that she is an analyst in South Asian regional security. She has written a number of articles for media such as Asia Times, Business Times, and South China Morning Post. Her articles appear to be critical of Hong Kong protesters and positive towards Chinese companies. Recently, researchers working on InfoOps discovered that Lin Nguyen is a fake person and that she does not exist. Her articles have been removed and her Twitter account suspended. Her profile photo was actually taken from a page of a real person who works in Singapore. Researchers also discovered from this case that stolen pictures can be cropped or turned into mirror images. This tactic makes the use of reverse image searches very difficult. Another fake expert, which you can see the picture below on the bottom uh, right, is Oliver Taylor. He is a student of England's University of Birmingham and has published articles in Jerusalem Post and Times of Israel. His falsehood was revealed after he wrote articles accusing a London academic and his activist wife as being terrorist sympathizers. The university said that it has no record of him as a student. Now, more importantly, image experts discovered that Taylor's profile photo is a very realistic forgery or what we can call a deep fake. Taylor's case is perhaps one of the earliest known cases where deep fake and weaponized narratives are combined. Third, on deepfakes, deepfakes are a growing concern due to advancements in artificial intelligence and machine learning. However, the threat of cheap fakes remains. Cheap fakes continue to be useful to propagandists who like the means to create deepfakes. Together, the impact is what people call more liars' dividends. With liar dividends, people become more aware of deepfakes and cheap fakes. They will, as a result, become more skeptical of everything they see and will become more and more likely to dismiss even authentic com content as fake. Looking ahead, the strategies and tactics that I mentioned earlier can be used by hostile actors in a post-COVID environment. We should be worried about info ops exploiting the second order effects of COVID-19, such as people shifting trust in political system institutions, the mental impact due to social distancing and increased exposure to online content, anger over civil liberties affected by contact tracing tech and repeated lockdowns, and the issue of who receives priority for treatment when an effective vaccine is created. Vaccines are particularly a key issue in InfoOps. It has become a theme in tech nationalism and geopolitical rivalries. In the past, there were already conspiracy theories about epidemics and vaccine. For example, the smallpox vaccine was said to leave the mark of the beast, and the AIDS spreading an AIDS virus spreading in Africa was said to be the work of rich Americans testing contaminated polio vaccines on poor Africans. So hostile actors may recycle all conspiracy theories with a contemporary twist using current strategies, issues related to the effects of COVID-19 and the great power tug of war for regional opinion in Southeast Asia. Also, Business, businesses that rely on connections between China and the West could be caught in the geopolitical crossfire. Their reputation and operations could be under info attacks if they appear to choose sides. Next, I will elaborate on cybersecurity, specifically on cyber attacks. So, crisis gives cyber attackers the opportunity to increase and innovate their tactics. This slide gives us a sense of the scale of malicious cyber activities linked to COVID-19. They include spam emails, malware, and fake internet domains. So while info ops focus on connective aspects, cyber attacks focus more on the digital and physical aspects. 
computer network attacks could disrupt public and commercial services that a country needs to run normally, while computer network exploitations enable threat actors to conduct reconnaissance and espionage. Of course, cyber attacks at the strategic level can support InfoOps. Southeast Asia is one region where they have seen numerous cyber attacks due to the high internet penetration and geopolitical factors. Here in Southeast Asia, technology is entrenching itself deeper in our lives, faster than we can preempt the attendant risks. Advanced Persistent Threat or APT actors are among the biggest threat actors that we face. To APT actors, cyber attacks for foreign intelligence collection and cyber attacks for economic benefits may serve strategically congruent goals. As Southeast Asian states try to recover from the impact of COVID-19, they will try to leverage key industries that have high potential for growth, like, for example, smart cities, and future-oriented industries to diversify their economies. Technology partners will become more important to sectors that traditionally rely less on tech. Looking ahead, these sectors could become more attractive to cyber criminals and spies. Cyber criminals are growing in their roles as cyberspace expands. In a way, cyber criminals are like the internet troll farms that support info ops to influence public opinion. They are engaged to hack, they are cyber, cyber privateers. They are motivated by financial gain, if not patriotism, and they are sponsored by different groups, state actors, criminal groups, radical political groups. For example, in the recent report by the UK Inter Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament, it is noted that Russia has sought to employ organized crime groups to supplement its cyber skills. In another recent example, the US reported that two private hackers were working for Chinese intelligence to steal trade information and COVID-19 related research. Now, Southeast Asia is also seeing rising political tensions. Government agencies and private industries with links to these tensions are targets for cyber espionage. If you recall, around the time of the Permanent Court of Arbitration ruling on South China Sea in 2016, the APT groups Nikon and APT30 had reportedly used spear phishing and, and malware to gather information on ASEAN meetings, media organizations, and government agencies in this region. Even the PCA court website was targeted. To some cyber com cybersecurity companies, they believe that Singapore was also targeted at that time. We should, we should also note that today, Disputes related to the law of the sea can also be heard in Singapore as Singapore has recently signed an agreement with the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. In the past few months, there were many reports of cyber attacks that exported COVID-19. They include Chinese APT-41 and Russian APT-29 hackers trying to steal research on vaccines, Vietnamese hackers APT-32 targeting China's government agencies, including Wuhan, fake contact tracing apps, and cyber attacks on hospitals in Czech Republic, putting people's lives in danger and disrupting COVID-19 testing. More recently, in June, several countries, including Singapore, were the target of a global COVID-19 team phishing campaign that is believed to be the work of the North Korean state hacker group, Lazarus. In the post-COVID-19 world, we can see more of such cyber attacks and its variations, targeting less traditional targets, such as schools and small and medium-sized enterprises. As work from home and the use of personal digital devices increase, threat, act threat actors can target individuals' personal information, such as emails, to gain insights to find ways to access more sensitive databases. This means that personal cybersecurity and endpoint protection is increasingly more important for corporate cybersecurity. Basically, we need to be on the, we, we need to be on the watch for unintentional insider threats. So COVID-19 has increased demand for cloud-based solutions for data storage, communication, and collaboration, such as Zoom and Google Cloud. China's cloud services, such as Huawei Cloud and Alibaba Cloud, are also in greater demand. For instance, Huawei has offered AI-enabled diagnostic systems to hospitals in Ecuador. And because of these developments, 5G technology is a priority because it could speed up data transfer from the cloud. One concern is the threat of man-in-the-middle attack where threat actors could insert themselves in the connection between the internet act users and international data centers. If you recall in 2013, Google was reportedly upset when Snowden leaked that the US National Security Agency tried to do this with Google and Yahoo's data centers. Today, 
the US and many countries are concerned that Huawei's dominance in 5G networks will allow China to install backdoors to access information flowing through these networks. If we look at the cyber attack lifecycle, backdoors are a tool that allow attackers to maintain a persistent foothold in a, system, in a system that has been infiltrated. Also, working from home and social distancing are making people spend more time on social media and network, networking platforms. So this creates more opportunities for cyber threat actors to use social media platforms and social networking platforms as delivery mechanisms for malware. For example, it was reported earlier this year that cyber hackers believed to be from North Korean Lazarus had used LinkedIn to find people who work in European defense firms. So documents with malware were then sent to these people via private messaging. In today's context, cyber threat actors will use time and patience to conduct long-term campaigns to gather intelligence before causing serious harm. Non-sensitive information can help point the way to sensitive information. One thing we can learn from the hacking of the US Office of Personal Management is that big data analytics co combined with non-sensitive and personal identifiable information with social media details and other intel resources to provide a deeper picture of the targets. Cyber threats can be a fusion of traditional espionage and cyber espionage. We should expect and prepare for a more contested cyberspace environment in the wake of COVID-19. Even now, Despite efforts to, to counter online malign behavior, there is almost no international accepted rules of behavior. No, sorry, no internationally accepted rules of behavior. So cyber threat actors are still testing the boundaries with fewer, fewer repercussions. Some states are also ramping up offensive cyber operations. For example, the recent report by the UK Inter Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament uh, on Russia states that this is an era of hybrid warfare and an offensive cyber capability is now essential. It is also reported in 2018 where President Trump has given CIA more powers to launch offensive cyber operations around the world. This will go beyond surveillance and data collection. And in June, hackers known as the Cyber Horrors Group had launched attacks on Ethiopian government websites after a dispute between Ethiopia and Egypt over the construction of a dam at the Nile River. So looking ahead, state-backed hackers could focus on vaccine research among other targets. As vaccine research is important to public health, polit political legitimacy, as well as geopolitical influence. Vaccine is an important resource like information and oil. So those who control vaccine could control the world. State-backed actors could also target healthcare systems to study how ill the people in the targeted states are, given some doubts over the accuracy over the collection and publication of certain pandemic statistics. In a lockdown world, traditional human espionage could become more, more difficult, so cyber espionage could become more practical. Also, in a pandemic-stricken world, using cyber attacks to hold people's health and lives ransom can be a powerful gray zone method to coerce a state without the use of force. So these issues, change the ideas of what makes up national security and what kind of data and assets should be the focus of intelligence collections and cybersecurity. To conclude, the cyberspace is continually changing alongside the technology and the global issues. Cyber threat actors are always finding new digital and connective vulnerabilities and new cyber ops methods. Cyber attacks that exploit opportunities in social media, cloud computing, mobile devices and critical infrastructure will target people and businesses as a means to pressure the government. Info ops target the, the people and businesses to change the policies and politics of a nation. For Singapore, we need to keep our cyber defenses strong because we are a smart nation. We are changing by becoming more digital at the industrial, social and individual levels. We are a small state caught in the middle of rising geopolitical tensions. And we are a society going through profound changes at the social and political levels. In this regard, we should note what 19th century French political scientist Dare Tocqueville once said. A society is more vulnerable when it is undergoing change. This is why we need a whole of society approach. And this is why total defense and digital defense is even more important now. Thank you.
Thank you everyone for hanging on. I understand that my presentation is uh, stands between you and lunch, so I would keep my presentation within the allocated 15 minutes. Um, and I would like to begin my presentation with the caveat that the title, The Rise of Hybrid Warfare in the Asia Pacific, is actually pretty much of clickbait. Uh, and I would sort of explain later why there is this clickbait effect when we look at hybrid warfare. So what I'm going to do is to actually use my lens as a historian along the lines of Colin Gray as well as Michael Howard to look at when we when we look at this notion of hybrid warfare, what exactly are the novel changes as well as the not so novel incremental changes when we look at this notion of hybrid warfare? Is it something new? Does it really set it apart from other previous forms of great power competition as well as asymmetric warfare? Or are we really looking at incremental changes in uh, hybrid warf within this notion of hybrid warfare as well as its associated concept of the gray zone. So um, essentially I would focus on three key issues. First, the concept of hybrid warfare and its associated notion of gray zone conflict. And then I'll look at certain aspects of hybrid warfare and gray zone conflict in our neck of the woods. Uh, the, by, by this, I mean the Asia-Pacific region, uh, both in the realm of state as well as non-state actors. And then finally, I will look at its implications for regional and national security, as well as try to weigh in on the, the uh, theme, which is the, the, the post-COVID-19 situation. And are there going to be any real changes uh, post-COVID-19? So in a nutshell, this would be my uh, three main talking points for my presentation. Um, and I would like to kick off by sort of giving everyone a working definition of what is hybrid warfare and what is gray zone conflict, because it is something which is still a moving target um, in a case where trying to pinpoint a working definition is concerned. Uh, and in my case, I think the most useful working def definition to hang around this particular discussion is what you find in this uh, excellent edited volume by fellow historians Williamson Murray as well as Peter Mansour where they define hybrid warfare as a conflict involving conventional military forces and irregulars which could include both state and non-state actors. But what is the aim over here? So when you look at both hybrid uh, both state and non-state hybrid actors, they, they are using hybrid warfare, a blend of both the conventional and irregular non-conventional to achieve a particular, a particular common political purpose. So that, I think, is the hallmark of hybrid warfare as well as hybrid actors. And now what about gray zone conflict? Um, in this case, um, I have two useful definitions, one provided by uh, Antonio Echevera, uh, for him, gray zone conflict is something that occurs below NATO's Article 5 threshold and below the level of violence necessarily, uh, necessary to prompt a UN Security Council resolution. Um, and the other one is provided by Nora Bessahel. Uh, she defines gray zone conflict as conflicts that lie between the spectrum of war and peace and they are neither nor neither war nor peace, but they lie somewhere in between. Um, so when you look at both definitions, I think race of conflict is something that pushes the boundaries, but in a sense that you have actors not wanting to push the boundaries so much that it crosses the threshold of high intensity war. So when we look at hybrid warfare and race of conflict, I think this is the space the realm that we are looking at, in which hybrid warfare and gray zone conflict or competition takes place. So essentially, we're looking at this continuum, right? This space uh, which straddles that of competition, conflict, and possibly just below the threshold of war. Um, and if you look at what General Joseph Hotel 
the former commander of uh, US SOCOM describes hybrid warfare and based on conflict, essentially is characterized by intense political, economic, informational, and military competition, more fervent than what is the norm in terms of state diplomacy. Uh, but nonetheless, this competition takes place. And again, going back to my earlier point about how in a gray zone, you have actors not wanting to cross the threshold into conventional high intensity combat or war. So hybrid warriors, be they state or non-state, they thrive and they specialize in this particular ambiguity of the gray zone. And so in this case, for example, uh, my colleague Kuma talked about uh, ISIS. At, at a high point, you have actually ISIS sort of moving from a shadowy insurgent group to sort of a proto state where they can administer territory. And at the end of the spectrum, you have, for example, uh, hybrid actors, state hybrid actors that can actually fight conventional wars. So they vary in capabilities as well as their intent in terms of their political intent, but what sets them apart from, for example, um, conventional war or what we think as uh, insurgencies uh, is a hybrid approach that sort of doesn't really fit well in our watertight definitions of how we sort of try to define conventional actors, do we put them in the, in the, in the space of conventional actors, or do we put them in the, the space of insurgents? Um, so hybrid warfare and grace and conflict, I would argue that it's not really new because hybrid warfare has existed for quite some time. So for example, if we look to the 19th century uh, in a different region, not in Asia Pacific, if we look at the Peninsular War, so the foremost military power and the foremost military instrument of that age is Napoleon's Grand Army. So in the Peninsular War, how did a weaker actor challenge the might of Napoleon's Grand Army? So in, in the Peninsular War, you have the uh, small expeditionary force of the Duke of Wellington's regular army uh, working in tandem with the Spanish irregulars in a hand uh, hammer and anvil approach. So regular actors working with irregular actors is not new. And in the Cold War in, in, in Vietnam, you actually have uh, the North Vietnamese regular army working in tandem with uh, Viet, Viet Cong insurgents. So here you have this fusion of both the state and uh, irregular capabilities. So when we look at military campaigns, this idea of fusing both irregulars and regular forces as well as that of military and non-military is not new. But what we are seeing in uh, 21st century hybrid warfare is that increasingly there is this fusion of non-state and proto-state-like and proto -state -like characteristics like ISIS. And increasingly we are also looking at tools which are non-kinetic rather than um, combat military power, conventional combat military power. So I would make the argument that when we look at what exactly sets a 21st century hybrid adversary apart from that of its 20th century or 19th century cousins is that we're looking at a more integrated set of multi-dimensional capabilities, be they in the military, political, information, or economic realm. Uh, and here you actually have increasingly the pushing and blurring of boundaries within this space. And it's very difficult to sort of respond by using conventional military power. So that's a tricky bit. How do you respond against uh, hybrid actors that essentially play a very, very different game and possibly using very, very different rules. And what do I mean by that? So in, in this case, I will look at what is happening right now in terms of great power competition in the gray zone, because one may argue that increasingly we are playing with a rather different set of rules. And going back to my earlier point, which I started out uh, when I mentioned this uh, analogy of clickbait, and this is very, very useful. 
So uh, to borrow Graham Allison's this notion of the to see this trap, I think what which uh, I think uh, a lot of you in this audience is familiar with, there is this sort of uh, misperception that what Allison is trying to argue is that, oh, you know what, you're going to have great powers actually going to war. But I think what he's really trying to tell us or warn us is that when we have a situation whereby you have a rising power challenging um, an established power, there could be certain dynamics that may lead to a war that nobody wants. So I think this, in essence, is what Graham Allison is trying to tell us when he uses the analogy of the Thucydides uh, threat by using uh, the, com the, the competition between uh, Athens and Sparta as a reference point. So as you can see, great power competition is not new. And um, those of you who have been through command school, either at the World College or Staff College, you probably would have learned this maxim from Sun Tzu. Uh, this idea that the, uh, the acme of strategy is to defeat your opponent's strategy, and then you follow, if that can't really work, you try to unravel his alliance, uh, and, and the worst thing that you can do is to lay siege to your uh, adversaries or your opponent's cities. Um, and he talks about, you know, this, this particular maxim of subduing your enemy without fighting, especially when you are up against an adversary with stronger military capabilities. And again, uh, when we look at this notion of when we're up against a much stronger military power and not exactly fighting according to the rules that, uh, that he wants, this is not new. But what we are seeing in the 21st century is this expansion of the so-called battle space where you have confrontations of entire systems. Again, here, you're not just, we're not just talking about the military instrument, but also political, economic, social, and legal. And this multi-dimensional competition and this expansion of battle space that has already happened doesn't really lend well to using the military as your primary instrument of influence. And what do I, and why do I um, say that? Because when we look at what is the power on the battlefield, if you read the work uh, of Pete Singer, where he talks about light for and how today is not really the command of the air or command of the sea that really matters, but rather command of attention and influence. So what brings us to command someone's attention? Going back again to my analogy of clickbait, right? You see something that's attractive, wow. You really, you really, you really, it really catches your attention. And with that, you can actually sort of work on influencing your audience. And I would say this is what military organizations have to be cognizant of that possibly when we look at the range of means and ways at your disposal, increasingly, when we look at this competition for influence as well as command of attention, possibly you have to look at uh, adjusting the tool sets, your tools at your disposal. And also going back to this uh, need for a better appreciation of uh, what is currently happening within the realm of great power politics as well as competition, uh, whether we need to look at a particular new understanding of the current world order as well as the rules in which great powers play. So um, that is sort of kind of like my broad survey of great power competition that is happening in the gray zone and we have to be uh, more cognizant of how the game has possibly changed and possibly you know the, the, the need to adjust to new rules, um, which we are still trying to figure out. So that's a great power competition. Uh, and for the latter half of my presentation, I would look at uh, an actor which uh, the earlier presenter Puma has talked about, ISIS in Southeast Asia. Um, and in this case, when we look at ISIS and their affiliates, they thrive in this particular space, which I define as uh, poorly governed gray zones. Um, and this gray zone, which I'm talking about, is this area which I've highlighted on the map um, surrounding the Sulu Sea, which straddles Malaysia, Indonesia, 
Philippines. Um, and prior to the formation of the modern Southeast Asian states of Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines, uh, you have coastal communities that are already living there and they have networks of kinship as well as economic networks that goes, harkens back to, uh, that predates modern Southeast Asia. And this network still exists. And this is the gray zone in which um, ISIS and their affiliates can actually use or exploit to expand their network. So this network, um, as Kumar has already sort of uh, highlighted earlier, you, you, you can have uh, the returning of fighters from, for example, uh, other regions back to Southeast Asia, as well as the introduction of foreign fighter elements into this uh, physical area. And, and also using those networks, you can have um, ISIS affiliates exploiting those networks to raise funds, uh, as well as exploit criminal elements to fa facilitate the transfer of uh, either material funds or foreign fighters, as well as you, the, uh, the transference of knowledge of new skills, tactics, and organizational capabilities that comes with this uh, physical connections, as well as you can uh, use a virtual space to grow this exchange as well. So you're actually seeing um, both the um, manifestation of hybrid warfare in the physical space as well as uh, the virtual space. And when we have this particular uh, manifestation of both the physical as well as uh, virtual space coming together, it makes things more difficult for government and state actors. And what do I mean by that? Um, so as we know, ISIS have lost the bulk of their territory in the Middle East. Um, but that doesn't mean that the fight against ISIS and their affiliates is over because through the virtual space, they can still, uh, as Kumar mentioned earlier, encourage attacks uh, of um, their affiliates in their home countries. And here you also have the possibility of ISIS coming back and get, regaining lost physical territory or even gaining new footballs as we are seeing right now in the Sahel as well as North Africa, uh, as well as the competition between uh, ISIS as well as Al-Qaeda affiliates. Um, the physical manifestation of ISIS in new geographical areas. So you have this evolution from what is a physical caliphate to a self-sustaining cloud-based community. So you have this, going back to the earlier point about this blurring of space between the physical and the virtual, which make things so difficult for um, state actors, particularly national security agencies to uh, respond to. Um, and now back to the, the theme of essentially the session about the impact of COVID-19. Uh, I would say here, there's a very clear impact when we look at the uh, rehabilitation process of the, the conflict torn, the conflict affected region of Marawi. So yes, there is a plan in place uh, and I would laud our uh, Filipino colleagues for uh, taking a very, very integrated whole of government. And in fact, I would say whole of society approach towards this because they have a task force which includes not only all the relevant government agencies, but also local government as well as local actors as well. But um, as you can see from the number of IEPs, uh, and, and in this case, I'm using the 2019 ICRC stats, 2019, uh, there are about 100,000 IEPs uh, in the conflict affected region of Marawi. Obviously, 2020, the figures will be lower, but still, it's, it's still a large figure. Um, and what COVID the impact of COVID-19 in, in, in this rehabilitation process is that when you have a prolonged crisis, um, resentment will set in. And with that, you, you may have to sort of rebuild the trust between locals, local population, 
the displaced population, um, be between them and the government and security forces. And what you want to avoid is um, ISIS affiliates coming in to exploit that resentment. And this is not something that's just happening in Marawi, but um, it's, it's also happening in uh, Idlib, in Syria, where you have this massive uh, IDP population that if their grievances uh, and their resentment aren't really resolved in the long term and there is this, pro this prolonged crisis, it makes the possibility of, um, of this, uh, this slide back to conflict uh, highly likely. And here, when you have a prolonged crisis, uh, what you have in terms of existing structures may not suffice for both the population of the conflict because what you want to do is to protect them from being influenced by uh, ISIS affiliates in Southeast Asia as well as the uh, provision of assistance by the existing structure that you have in place. So uh, that, in, in my assessment, is what COVID-19, its implications it has on the rehabilitation process of Morawi uh, and essentially it's a case whereby as long as you have this uh, prolonged crisis, it makes the response of government agencies uh, a little bit more difficult and they may have to calibrate uh, their approach. Um, and if we look at the actual physical space in terms of the, the actors in the conflict zone. Um, you have this sharing of information, which I talked earlier. So we are looking at a diffusion process, not only uh, in terms of information, but also techniques, tactics, uh, and also you know, um, how to innovate. So essentially, Clifford Rogers in his book, The Military Revolution Debate, he defines the fusion as a process by which an innovation is communicated through certain channels over time. So here we are looking at the adaptation, the uh, adoption of new novel innovations of others, but filtered through one's own culture. And I would say this happens for both states as well as uh, hybrid non-state actors. So here I have images taken from uh, the actual physical battle space of Marawi, you have the use of man aircraft, both fixed wing and rotary, as well as drones. And in this case, the drone in the picture, both in the top and the right, um, is actually something that you can buy off the shelf. So it's a DJI drone that costs just a few thousand dollars. Uh, obviously, you have the million dollar types flying a lot higher. But here you have the diffusion of, of technology. So you have two very, very different drone systems. One, the high-end multi-million dollar drone systems uh, that states can afford, as well as off-the-shelf drones that can be used by states, as well as non-state actors and adapted for, for their own particular uh, needs. So when we look at technological diffusion, it's more rapid, but they do not really require the complex infrastructure and systems to develop as well as operate. So what is previously within the monopoly of just state actors, uh, unmanned weapon systems, now you have non-state actors and possibly hybrid actors having them. So you have the redistribution of technology as well as combat power to, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, weaker actors. And this happens. And it's, I think this is something which uh, we will still see in the post-COVID-19 environment where this diffusion of both ideas as well as technological innovations will continue to take place in the battlefield, in the battle space, but adopted and adapted through 
the very particular requirements of states as well as non-state actors. Um, so when we look at what are the implications and responses, um, I would like to sort of uh, end off by looking at this, uh, th th this particular competition that's happening between great powers in the gray zone, whereby, because going back to my earlier point about the rules of the game have changed, uh, essentially we may sort of have a instance, again, I, I'm using the uh, warning by Graham Allison of unintended conflict escalation where you have both states do not really want to go to war, but as they become more deeply involved in the conflict or competition, there might be uh, the unintended consequences of conflict escalation to something which both sides do not really want, but certain actions can push the threshold because we don't really have possibly the mechanisms to de-escalate should that particular threshold be crossed. So that's for great power competition in the gray zone. Um, and what can states do? So I think for states, um, and I include small states like Singapore, uh, we have to develop a whole range of options, a whole range of options uh, that can be used uh, below this threshold and has to be multidimensional. Uh, and going back to my earlier point about command of attention and influence, uh, these capabilities will have to send a clear signal to uh, potential adversaries, right? And this is, and this signal has to be clear. Uh, so I think the need for clarity in terms of responses, uh, it's very, very important um, in dealing with hybrid threats in the gray zone. But there's also a case where, where, whereby your hybrid adversary may not be deterred. So going back to Kumar's uh, particular uh, point about how uh, certain individuals may not be deterred and uh, they, they become violent actors. So what if you can't really 100% prevent uh, hybrid actors from enacting political violence? So in this case, possibly building resilience may be a better option than hardening protection. So we go back again to uh, what Kumar started out with uh, the, uh, the pillars of total defense. So societal resilience might be something that we may need to pay more attention to. So the big if, what, you know, what if something happens? What if, again, I, I'm using if with a capital I and a capital F, what if a violent attack happens in Singapore? So in this case, resilience might be more useful uh, and we need to sort of rely on the resilience of our local societies to bounce back when something like this happens. As we can see with the COVID-19, uh, we come together rather than sort of um, riff apart. So in this case, uh, resilience, I think, would be something that uh, we might need to pay a little bit more attention on. Um, and finally, I will end off with hybrid warfare and its implications for military transformation. So um, the bulk of transformational efforts has always been focused on traditional military readiness. The capacity of joint forces against state-based opponents is very much seen as the, the main standard uh, when militaries look to transform. Uh, so essentially we're looking at major combat contingencies, uh, the sole 1% contingency that states cannot lose. But then again, um, is this traditional understanding of strategic priorities something which um, has to change? Hence, I, I use the question mark. Because by focusing on traditional military readiness, are we sort of risking being underprepared for the other hybrid contingencies that we talk about that may not be um, easily dealt with with traditional military power? And so there are certain limits to what military power can do. So how do you know that you're winning? How do you know that you're winning? And one 
particular image that gives a very clear impression of victory that you're winning is this picture that I have over here, which is sort of, you know, inspired by the raising of, of, of the flag uh, on the island of Iwo Jima, Mount Suribachi. I can't think of any picture that gives you a better sense of winning, you know, raising the flag. But as we know, when the Marines raised the flag on Mount Suribachi, the, the fight, combat did not end, right? Uh, they still had to spend uh, time uh, dealing with the uh, Japanese forces that were hidden deep in the mountains. And so this particular vision of victory, I think is something that uh, we, we tend to focus on, but what if there is a, a more elusive kind of victory that cannot be readily defined? And I think this is where um, the COVID-19 situation actually um, helps me to spend time on things which I did not previously do. So, you know, academics, we speak read a lot. So one of the books that I've actually spent read is this wonderful book by General Anthony Zini, the uh, uh, ex-commander of CENTCOM before the first shots are fired. So let me read to you something which I think uh, hits the nail on the head when we look at how militaries in today's context are searching for that very, very elusive image, definition, or metrics of victory. So the, um, the heading of this particular chapter is, is this really, really important question. How do you know when you are winning a war? So when sort of giving a deep read of uh, Tony's in his work, this is what really struck me. Uh, and I'm going to read to you this very, very uh, salient paragraph. He writes, there's the old fashioned way. You beat your enemy in a decisive battle, seize terrain, march up to his capital, eject the government, and install a new one more congenial to your interests. We are very familiar with fighting that kind of war, hence the raising of flag on Mao Surabachi. We know how to fight an enemy whose sources of strength and vulnerabilities, centers of gravity, are similar to ours. That are in military language, symmetrical with ours and are vulnerable to destruction or destruction by weapons and systems we are familiar with. But how do you know whether you are winning when you don't know how many points you've scored? There's no scoreboard and the enemy fights a seemingly endless war anywhere and everywhere in the country. How do you win against a shadowy enemy with no uniform units? willing to meet you in war deciding battle. No capital he needs to defend and no particular pieces of ground he needs to hold. How do we fight an enemy that refuses to fight by our rules? The rules that you know, are encapsulated as you can see in this picture. So with that, um, I would leave you with this pressing question, which I think even the best and brightest minds are still trying to figure out. So with that, I. Uh, conclude my presentation, I'm happy to take questions.